Now we will talk about deer. What not. Uh, again, going through all the different control methods, uh, the habitat and cultural are usually related to the one of the problems that we have in town when people put out ornamentals, but it's also part of the problems that occur in farms. Uh, we put some of that nice lush alfalfa or just uh, irrigate hay fields and wonder why the deer go there. It tastes a whole lot better than that old dry stuff that they, they can get up on the, the uplands. And so some of our practices uh, don't allow us to modify the habitat, but certainly a lot of it is cultural. People should consider if they're moving into a place that has uh, historic deer damage, uh, deer damage uh, looking at what, what they might plant that's going to be less palatable. Um, I've heard a lot of people say they don't have problems with deer eating this and so we should plant that. Well, quite often, deer don't eat something because there's other things available. And when they get hungry enough, they'll eat anything. Uh, this year, deer are eating spruce trees. And we know how unpalatable and actually how uh, what little nutrition that has for deer. And they're eating it when there's nothing else that they can get. Um, and a lot of times during the winter when we have a year like this where the ground freezes, uh, we get snow, the snow melts, then the snow freezes. The deer can't even get down to, to forage for um, uh, grass or forage. And so if there's not some browse available, uh, then they do head to anything that they can get. Uh, so their persistence in trying to eat something that's in your yard or your garden depends a lot on what else is available. Uh, we always talk about the, the, the conifers uh, not being as palatable, and that's certainly true. Likewise, there's some heavy waxy leaves that are less palatable, but there are also, there are also some plants uh, that are not as palatable, and all the nurseries know which ones are less likely to get browsed. Uh, you can go on my website, and there's a, a list of plants there that uh, are recommended uh, as ways to, to not provide things that are so palatable. Um, quite often, the phones in an area, and they've had deer problems year after year, or they have a, uh, a garden or something that is just a real attraction, uh, the only permanent solution is exclusion. And there's uh, several different ways that that can be done. Some of them are permanent, some of them are not permanent, some of them are uh, more of an eyesore, some of them are less of an eyesore, some of them are more effective than others. But uh, everyone needs to know what the options are so that then they can decide what's best in their area. Electric fence will work. Uh, the electric fence needs to be six feet high, uh, needs to be at least 3,000 volts, uh, it's important, and this is the most important thing, that it be tested constantly. Make sure that battery is charged. Uh, six strands as a minimum, uh, three hot and three brown. Uh, and then generally you can have your best success if you coat that fence, the hot wires, with peanut butter. Uh, do that before you turn it on. Uh, but if you, if you forget, you'll know real quickly. Uh, but anyway, the peanut butter coating makes it so that the first time the deer approaches that new fence, contacts it with that wet nose or that wet tongue, and it's going to get the full 3,000 volts. And then the fence actually becomes a repellent, something that they, they don't even want to go up to. Because we know that they can fit between those wires. They can squeeze through that quite easily. But once they know what happens when they do that, then you, you end up having a, a, a deer that's gotten educated. Um, likewise, the reason for the peanut butter coating is that you want that wet tongue or wet nose to touch first because if they do go through, the hair of a deer can be quite insulated. It can be something that keeps them from, uh, from getting a, a charge of electricity. Um, and this is the kind of fence, if somebody wants to go with electric, this is what I recommend they use. However, we have repelled deer with single strand electric wire. If, again, you coat it with the molasses or peanut butter, uh, and they have alternatives. If they like to walk around the neighborhood and they happen to come up there at night and they found out they like to browse on whatever your shrubs are, uh, but they've got alternatives, sometimes a single strand of wire around there, again, electrified with at least 3,000 volts, um, uh, can work to keep them away. Uh, again, if there's something else for them to eat. So, so sometimes that can, can can work because most people say, well, I've got this pretty house and these nice shrubs, and the last thing I want is a six foot high fence in front of my shrubs. And so that's where something like this might be the answer. So you can try that. Um, poly fences, it's a plastic uh, uh, fencing material. Uh, it's quite durable for plastic, but
but it, it really isn't very durable. We did some testing with that. We never had any of them last over two years. And usually when they finally broke down, it wasn't the, it wasn't the sun. It was icing that would get on them, and then the wind would blow and they would break. So the poly fences, again, aren't very permanent. Um, been involved in several studies looking at fencing projects, looking at fencing uh, designs. Um, some of them just looking at different materials like the poly fence, electric, and different things like that. A few years ago, we nailed it down to five fence designs that we wanted to test to find out if somebody was going to invest in a fence to repel deer and elk we were looking at, uh, what should they use? So we set up a project where we had these different fence designs and we had a control uh, that was just a standard four strand barbed wire fence that's used on most farms. Um, and then we baited these different fence designs with uh, good alfalfa hay. And when the deer would get inside there, we would replenish it so that we could, could look, at, uh, look at several uh, repetitions of the trial. And uh, at the end of the, the time, we found that there were some fences that really didn't work at all and some fences that worked quite well. One of the key features of this project is we were looking at modifying existing fences. We've all heard of the New Zealand fences that can cost up to fifteen or twenty thousand dollars a mile. We were looking at ways to cut that cost uh, so that if, if a farmer did have a high value pasture, or in some of the places now where we're worried about elk and brucellosis, and they want to keep the elk out of their their calving area or maybe a, a feeding area they use during the winter, uh, what were some options for excluding deer and elk? Anyway, what we found out. Uh, is there were some of the designs that the fence, that the deer would learn how to get through. Uh, some of them, you know, never worked right from the beginning. Uh, but the bottom line was the pollution, the permanent solution uh, was a net wire fence uh, that we built using existing fences, uh, six feet high. Uh, we used two rolls of wire, one four foot roll, one two foot roll. Uh, one of the things we found out in this study is that 72 inches, 6 feet, is all that is needed to keep deer and elk out of uh, an area, to keep them from crossing the fence. And we all say, oh, I've seen a deer jump more than 6 feet. Well, there's a difference between a deer that's looking for food to eat and a deer that is trying to escape from something. And that's why we never had any of them go over any of these fences during the, the two years we did the study. But the net wire fence, extending the height of an existing fence, we could do for $3,500 a mile. And this was our, our most expensive design. And that's why we were able to do it cheaper. So when you look at uh, $3,500 a mile, fencing out a, a garden area or a, a small pasture um, isn't really that expensive when you look at the long term at last. The way that we extended the fence is we looked at several different designs. Some of them involved welding a piece of rebar to a, a T-post. Some of, some of them we just clamp the, the bar onto the T-post or you can even be as crude as wiring it. Uh, but uh, there, there are some commercial things made to modify a T-post to, to extend those. Um, on the wooden fences, we simply uh, used a 3 8 drill bit, drilled a hole in the top of the fence post, and drove in a piece of 3 8 inch rebar. And that's how we extended the height of the fence there. And then the corners, we used angle iron, uh, the corners and the gates in order to uh, extend those fences. Again, all it was doing was holding the wire. We weren't intending these extended fences to be holding bowls in the pasture or something like that. So it worked real good for excluding deer and elk, even though you wouldn't want to do that if you had a, a pasture for livestock or things that were trying to get out. Uh, but the fencing is really kind of the permanent solution. Repellents. There are repellents that are used for deer. Uh, two kinds of repellents. There's area repellents and contact repellents. And as the name implies, the area repellents are meant to just make the deer stay out of that vicinity. Um, we've used everything from human hair to blood meal to soaps to urine to our old ultrasonic devices. And, and generally, they're, they're not effective. Uh, uh, again, they're not effective if the deer want to be there anyways. I'm not saying you can't get a picture of deer uh, in a yard looking at some blood meal on the ground and then walking around it and people say, see, it's being repelled. But again, in our controlled studies that were conducted, um, it really, it's really difficult to repel deer out of an area 
using these types of things. Contact repellents, on the other hand, do provide some limited protection. They're, they're usually things that you spray on vegetation and uh, they're distasteful. The deer just don't want to browse on that when it's there. And they must be replied quite off, reapplied often because if it rains or uh, sometimes even with wind and sun for a couple weeks, it needs to be reapplied. Again, sometimes it's, it's, it's a, a, a good tool to use. And they do work. Some of them have putrefied eggs. Some of them are a type of a hot sauce. Uh, uh, thyram is an a active ingredient of some effective uh, deer repellent. Um, and again, it depends on whether they have anything else to eat. During the winter, if the deer are starving and they don't have anything to eat, they, they will eat just about anything, no matter how distasteful it is. But uh, for most of our summer ornamental type things, um, some of the contact repellents can work. Frightening devices, uh, some of them do work. Uh, the, there's some new things that people are starting to use that I think uh, hold the promise of being a major solution. And these are motion activated devices. Things that only go off when the animal breaks the beam or gets close enough to them. The reason they work better is most scare devices, the animals can get used to them. A deer can stand there for a half hour staring at a scarecrow and then realize the thing doesn't move, it doesn't react, it doesn't respond, and they just keep getting closer and closer, and before long you're rubbing on it. Uh, when you use these scare devices, um, they only get turned on when the animal gets close enough, and then something unpleasant like a sprayer uh, will, will go off. Now, is, is it does work very good. Downside, so you do have a hose laying there, unless you're going to pipe something in. Uh, they go off when the dogs go by, they go off when the birds fly over, so you know there's a lot of, of, of irritations that go along with that. But I do think they, they hold some promise to develop some, some things that are, are going to work better. Um, I was working for a while on a motion activated device that just uh, threw up some streamers and then closed back down. It didn't spray water or anything. It just ran off batteries. But uh, weatherproofing it was the hardest, was the problem that we ran into. But we'll keep trying. But at any rate, uh, some of those motion activated devices are going to work good. Removal. A lot of places where we have deer problems, it's because they can't be hunted. Um, as you all know, when deer are hunted, they get pretty wary. Uh, a lot of states, much more so than Montana. but. Uh, uh, deer that are hunted do tend to get wary and stay out of the area where they're being hunted. However, in towns and so forth, that's usually not an option, even though more municipalities are now using these marksmen uh, to actually go in and get rid of deer uh, by reducing the population. I think we've gone the, the route of looking at everything from birth control to live capture to transplanting, and they, they really are not practical, uh, nor are they feasible, because in most cases, the uh, the, the animals just don't have, we only have any place to put the animals if we transplant them. And birth control is so expensive, and uh, there's always some other ones that do breed, and the population keeps going up. And uh, a lot of times they finally take some action when people start getting hurt, traffic accidents, uh, but certainly the property damage is a part of it. But on some of our farms and ranches and more rural communities, small acreage areas, it is possible to harvest. Uh, deer and to get the population down to make them more wary. But if you're using hunting to reduce the deer herd, the thing I always like people to remember is that if somebody comes in there and shoots a buck, you remove that buck. But if somebody goes in there and shoots a doe, you get rid of that doe, you get rid of her offspring, you get rid of her offspring's offspring. So the bottom line is don't say that you're using hunting to reduce the deer herd if all you're shooting is buck. If you're going to remove if you're going to remove deer to reduce the deer herd, Shooting does is the most effective way to do it. Uh, I'm not saying that there's sometimes you can use uh, a buck as a, a carrot to get people to come and shoot the doe or something like that, and, and that can work. But uh, the main thing is, for the purposes of reducing the herd, you need to, to get rid of the does. All righty, so that's that on deer. And I'll show you some of the things that uh, we have there on the big screen. Yeah, I'm too okay, this is just some of the materials that I was talking about to use for modifying the fences. Uh, some, a lot of different ways to do it. On this one area, we actually used electric fence 
uh, insulators that would go onto the T-post, and we drilled those out uh, to 3 eighths of an inch, and then put, uh, put a piece of fiberglass rod in there to extend the fence up to 6 feet. And so there's a lot of different ways you can do that, as well as welding and everything else. There's, uh, just you can be creative on that. Uh, this is that uh, motion-activated device that sprays with water. Um, it's, it's very simple, just the thing that sits in the front and the sprayer turns on and it uh, will scare the deer away. This is called a, a scarecrow. Um, they're available online. A lot of times if you just do a search for deer scare devices, uh, it'll, it'll come up. Um, and that works. Like I said, I, I think I've got some high hopes for those. I even think there's potential for larger scale uh, areas to be protected using some motion-activated device to, to scare 